how to attain spirituality in the modern world. I'm sure we, all of us, we know how difficult uh, it is to be uh, spiritual in a society where there's lots of destruction, everything around us is opposite to what we want. So uh, we were wondering that this topic is very important for us, especially for youngsters in this community. So for this, inshallah, Sheikh Dr. Suhaim Afan will be speaking for about 45 minutes, and followed by uh, any question, about 10 minutes question and answers related to the topic. Uh, and obviously Sheikh Suhaim Hassan, he doesn't need an introduction, but those of who are probably young brothers and sisters, for your benefit, I'd like to say he is a graduate of Islamic University in Medina al um, around 1960. 66. And also he obviously uh, pursued a PhD, in doc a doctorate. He um, has studied under prominent scholars such as Sheikh uh, Ben Baz, Sheikh uh, Muhammad al shantiti and other famous scholars in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He um, is also a co-founder, I believe also a co-founder of Islamic Sharia Council in Leighton and he's currently a secretary in Sharia Council. And uh, he's been actively involved in many, many activities. Uh, even just Sheikh, last week I was in uh, Brexit on Sea uh, near Hastings. And I met a few brothers who were speaking about Sheikh. They said Sheikh used to go to Hastings last week uh, a couple of years ago. So I was really surprised that he used to travel around the country uh, serving the uh, knowledge of Allah, the uloom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah preserve him and grant barakah in his life, his wealth and in his uh, health. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Without any further ado, Sheikh Suhaim Hassan. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru wa na'udhu billahi min sururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man ya'dihi allahu fala mudilla lah wa man yudlil fala hadiya lah وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونفس وما سواها قد علحمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها <تصفيق> Dear Brother Qadi Rahman, my dear distinguished Muslim brothers in this mosque, I'm very privileged to be here this evening. This is the first time I'm coming to this mosque, which is the mosque named after Shah Jalal. I think a great prominent scholar in, uh, in uh, Bangladesh and Bengal. And uh, Alhamdulillah, you were able to create this mosque. And uh, if I ask Khalil for Rahman, what is the number of this mosque among the all the mosques of uh, United Kingdom? Would you have any number, any idea what number this mosque would be? It must be over a thousand, huh? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> as you know that uh, just hundred years ago or more than just one hundred years ago in 1889 the first mosque was established in this country what was that mosque the first mosque was in Queen there are two mosques both of them they were created in 1889 in the end of 1889 so the first one which was uh, around September, that is uh, uh, Woking Mosque. And then in December, that was uh, the mosque in Liverpool. 
which was established by the, the Sheikh al-Islam of United Kingdom or British Isles. That was uh, Mr. William, William, who was named as Sheikh Abdullah, the Sheikh al-Islam of the British Isles. So at that time, just imagine two mosques, just two mosques uh, in these islands. And uh, Sheikh William, who was uh, the founder of the Mosque of Liverpool, he was visited by a great English writer, John Lane Poole, that was uh, in 1889. He visited that mosque and he saw only a few people sitting there. And then he wrote a book, and that is uh, Studies in Mohammedanism. There is a chapter in that book called Islam in Liverpool, where he describes that mosque. And then he says in the end that uh, in uh, British Isles, there might be around, uh, around 200 Muslims, 50, 54 in Liverpool, some in Manchester, some in London, and few students in walking. And he also said at that time that if uh, Islam keeps on going with such a slow pace, uh, it is going to die abruptly in these aisles. He said it only uh, more than 120 years ago. And now, what can you see here in this British Isles? Did it die or it is progressing? Progressing. Uh, there are more than a thousand mosques throughout uh, British Isles. That is all because what Allah SWT wanted. Allah SWT wanted something good for these Isles. So this is why, this is why in those days uh, there were migrants coming from, from uh, India, from many parts of India and uh, they started this movement to spread Islam. And the first thing they used to do, that is to establish a mosque. So the mosque is the center, always is the center of guidance, center of purification, center of education. And uh, this is what our Prophet Wasallam has done when he came to Al-Madinah. The first thing he did, to establish the mosque. So this is uh, something very great uh, which the Muslims have achieved in these aisles and which you are achieving it here in this area of, of East London. Now the subject which is given to me that is the purification, spirituality. And for that I have recited these two ayat which were recited up by our Qari Sahib's men. And by the soul, and how Allah Taala has given a proportionate uh, form to it, and then He revealed to the nafs, to the soul, what is good, what is bad, what is taqwa, what is fujur. The person who keeps on purifying his soul is successful. And the person who is covering, covering his, his soul with sins, uh, is not successful. So in these ayat, Allah SWT has given us the clue how to purify. And the purification leads you to the, to the success in this life. And the person who does not purify himself, he is uh, a complete failure in this life. So purification is needed. But how to purify yourself, which is uh, the subject matter. How to purify yourself. There is a spiritual purification and there is a physical purification. All of us know about physical purification. You have to purify your town, your streets, your house. If the rubbish is left outside for many days, what is going to happen? Lot of flies, mosquitoes and it would be a dirty thing, attracting all these flies, and you have to clear it. If you don't clear it, the council will ask you to clear it. So everybody knows about this physical purification. But Allah and even our Prophet 
they join these two things together physical purification and spiritual purification after wudu what is the dua after wudu after wudu anybody remember this ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu Allahumma ijalni min al-tawabi wa ijalni min al-mutatahirin. You see, two things. Allahumma ijalni min al-tawabin. Spiritual, spiritual purification. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make me among those people who repent. Repent from the sins. Wa ijalni min al-mutatahirin. And make me among those people who clean themselves. That is after. Wudu, you have cleaned yourself with water. So that is the physical purification. And Allah SWT reminded you at once, that is not enough. That is not enough. You have to purify your soul, your heart as well. That is to turn to Allah SWT. Ya Bani Adam, qad anzalna alaykum libasan, yuwari sawatikum wa risha, wa libasu taqwa dhalika khay, wa libasu taqwa dhalika khay. Again in this ayah, of Surah Al-Araf, O Bani Adam, we have given you قَدْ أَنْزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسًا يُوَارِ سَوْعَاتِكُمْ We have given you dresses, attires, which are going to cover your shins. And not only simple attires, but just like the attire of Gandhiji, huh? just small attire <laughs> to cover your shin only. No, وَرِيشَا Risha means feathers. Feather means in a good type of dresses. Now you see how the dresses differ from country to country. In Nigeria, for example, colorful dresses, even for men, very colorful dresses. <laughs> In our area, we got the Sherwani today, mashallah. Huh? Sherwani. And our Sheikh got uh, this Arabic dress, though. So that is Warisha, and Allah SWT has given you feathers, means good type of attires. That is to cover yourself. Cover your shames. وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٍ But the attire of taqwa is better. What is the attire of taqwa? That is the attire of taqwa which is in your heart, that you fear Allah SWT. That is the attire of taqwa. If there is no fear of Allah SWT, then you can't have uh, any, any type of, uh, of purification at all. You need this taqwa, which means the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is taqwa? The best definition of taqwa is There is the punishment from Allah There is the hellfire. Make between you and that hellfire a barrier. A barrier, something which save you from that hellfire. That is, that is your taqwa. In physical world, if it is raining, uh, what is that? Uh, which save you from uh, rainwater? Umbrella. That is your physical taqwa. Here, uh, it is always the example of umbrella for rainwater. But in Arabia, in our countries, it is hot sun. In hot sun, this umbrella becomes your niqaya, your taqwa. So you need a physical taqwa. Everybody knows about that. But Allah SWT told you that this is a physical taqwa which is known to every person, even to the animals. To the beast. Even you, you see the hen. And uh, at the time of danger, when it sees uh, the cat, for example, it becomes alert. With its sticks, she, she wants to cover them under her wings to protect them because she knows about this stuff. Even in the jungle, There are uh, beasts, very strong, very fabulous. But if uh, these type of beasts, like buffalo, buffalo itself is a very fabulous animal. And if there is a herd of buffalo, they don't fear anyone, not even the lions, not even the tigers. But if the buffalo is just alone, knows that now he is alone and then he becomes very alert. This is why they say that buffalo, if it is alone, it is the most dangerous animal. So 
Don Gullier to it. Because uh, in East Africa, I have lived in East Africa as well, in Kenya, and seen so many safari parks. So, they say that if you find the buffalo alone, don't go near to it, because it will become very, very dangerous. That it is going to charge you, because the first thing it is going to think that you are going to attack. So, he would be ready to, to charge you as well. <coughs> he wants to save himself. This is his taqwa. So, in animal kingdom, in human kingdom, everybody knows how to save yourself. If it is hot, if it is too cold, how to cover yourself properly, to save yourself from all the dangers of the cold weather. So Allah SWT is telling us that physical taqwa is known to you. Try to create this spiritual taqwa, spiritual taqwa. And our Prophet used to do tazkiyah, purification. A young man came to the Prophet And this person, what a curious question did he ask? Atta'zanuli fi zina. The Prophet of Allah, do you allow me to, to commit fornication? Now, if it, it was any other teacher like us, he must have taken a stick and started beating this person. <laughs> what are you asking, huh? Such an ugly person, bad person, you are asking about them? The Prophet he is our example. So he said to him very politely, man, man, do you like this thing to happen to your sister? Do you like it to happen to your mother? No. Do you like it to happen to your aunt? No. Do you like it to happen to your aunt? No. So he said, yes. If you want to fornicate with any woman, she must be sister of someone. She must be might be mother of someone. She might be aunt of someone. So people don't like it for their own women folk. So how could you do it then? The man realized. This young man realized. And then he said, Tuk to Allah. I repent to Allah SWT. And the Prophet SAW make a dua for him. That is the dua of the Prophet SAW. Allahumma ghudda basara wa hassin farja wa ghfir ramba Oh Allah SWT, make his eyesight lowering all the time. Make him to protect his, his uh, private part and make his sin forgiven. With the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu this lad became the most pious lad, most pious lad in the body. Hardest lowering his gaze when he is walking in the streets. So that is, uh, that is the way of the Prophet Now why in Islam mixed gatherings are not allowed for men and women, mixed gathering? Why they are not allowed? It does not mean that if there is a mixed gathering there will be something bad, no? But this is known as to take some precautions, precautionary measures. As the Prophet said, Ma khala rajulun bimra'atin illa wa thalisahum shaitan. When a person is sitting alone with a woman, yani, who is not her mahram, her not relative, then the third person, the third person to spring in, who is that person? Shaitan, because shaitan is looking for such type of opportunities. So, try to keep away from such type of, of activities. In this country, this is, uh, this is a real issue. Uh, every boss got a secretary. And normally they are ladies. So this is uh, really a problem in this country. Uh, we don't say problem, we say it is an issue, it is an issue. So this is why uh, we, we don't say that they should not go and work. They can do work, the women, they can go, they can do work, but with taking all precautions of hijab, of hijab and non-salwa, no privacy, 
in the mind. And what privacy means that you are alone in a room where uh, the door is uh, closed, the windows are closed, that is called privacy. But if, uh, for example, uh, there is no such thing, then of course uh, there is nothing wrong with that. But these are the pre precautionary measures which are taken by uh, by Islam, by our Prophet That gives you uh, purification of your soul. Another thing which is very important, that is good company. Especially for the lad, I would say, you know, have your good company, always the good company. If you got good, good company, good uh, friends, they are, what they are going to instruct you. All right, today there is a speech in the mosque, come, attend the speech. Let us go and pray with Jamaat. This is what they are going to do. And the bad company, for bad company, what is going to happen? I used to go to uh, Warm Scrump, Warm Wood Scrump Prison, which is uh, the biggest prison in London. So I used to go there, not as a prisoner, I don't know, <laughs> as an <a> imam. <laughs> and Friday, I used to lead uh, the Friday prayer in my mosque. That time I used to live in Tottenham. And then I will take uh, my journey to Warm Scrum as the Imam, and they are going to bring me all the Muslim inmates in the hall where I have prayed them and then lead them in the prayer. So I have done this job for about 18 years, 18 years, and many interesting things have happened to me there. <laughs> but the main thing is that sometime I used to ask the brother after the prayer, a new brother has come, why are you here? Huh? What led you to the prison? So what is the answer? What is that, oh, I'm coming from my country. Some, some people are coming from Bangladesh, some are coming from Pakistan. So I was just coming to UK. And my friend uh, told me, just take my this small suitcase, my bag as we done, and give it to someone in London. Now he is, he has given him a bag. And the, the poor person thinks that this is, this bag got uh, uh, some, uh, some good things here, some food here, some perfumes here. But what was there? Do you know? <laughs> yes, it contains in hidden sockets, it contains drugs. So this poor person, right from Heathrow, he will go to all <laughs> the and now he is saying, no, I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. Yes, you are innocent. But because you are of your bad company, you end it up here. If you would, if you got a good company, good friends, they might have done dua for you, for you when you were traveling. Given you something nice. But this man led you into the prison. So always keep away from the bad company. Always have the good company. That is very, very important. And uh, another thing which is very, also very needed for the purification, that is your attachment to the Book of Allah This Quran is an amazing book. It has guided the humanity to what can save them from the hellfire. It has purified so many souls, so many souls. There are so many stories of this nature. I know about uh, that story that you know, there was a man from uh, subcontinent from India, Pakistan, in America. And he wanted to marry an American woman. She was not a Muslim. And this person also was not a good Muslim at all. But he got only one perception that I should marry a Muslim woman. So when he wanted to marry this woman, he asked her that there is one condition. You have to profess Islam. She said, what is Islam? He said, let us go to the Imam, sir. So in Chicago, they came to the center and they met the Imam. And Imam told her about Islam, and uh, 
Then he gave her a copy of a Quran. That this is the book of Islam, read this book. Now they are both married. And they came back and uh, life was normal. So one day this woman was uh, very depressed, sitting very depressed. So the man said, uh, what happened to you? She said that sometime I got this depression. But when I was a Christian, I used to go to the priest and uh, he's going to advise me a few things. I don't know what to do now. He said, all right, let us go to the Imam and ask, ask him what is the solution. So Imam said to her that I gave you the copy of the Quran to read. The read of Quran. This is your treatment. Read the Quran. So she came back and started reading the Quran. Mashallah, she read the translation. This is why either you should know Arabic to understand the Quran or you must read the translation of the Quran. So she read the Quran within a few months. Now the man came back from his office one day and uh, he found her again very agitated, very agitated. What happened to you today? Now, she said, now what happened to me? I have read the Quran and after reading the Quran, I have become a Muslim, a real Muslim. Hmm? I know that I have to pray, I have to fast, I have to give zakat, I have to abstain from haram. I knew all these things, so I have become a good Muslim now. But what agitating me now is that I am a Muslim, but you are, <laughs> you are not a Muslim. You don't pray. Huh? You don't fast, you eat haram. So how could I live with you? How could we live under the same roof? This is my problem now. <laughs> so the man said, what? After reading the Quran, this is what has changed you? Oh, he said, Allah, give me this Quran as well. So let me read it. So Allah SWT blessed him as well. And after reading the Quran, he became a nice Muslim, a good Muslim. So this Qur'an, Allah SWT has revealed to you, to guide you, to purify you, to educate you, to increase your Iman. This is not just like uh, to be kept on the shelf. There is a tradition in our culture, maybe in Bangladesh as well, at the time of wedding, uh, they gave a copy of a Qur'an to the bride and to the bridegroom. All right, now this is a gift from us. And they take it and they kiss it and they put it on the shelf <laughs> and it remains there. And after death, then people have to open Quran once again. Huh? Mm -hmm. And they have to read uh, part by part just to push this person into the diseased person into a jannah. But this is how they are treating the Quran. No. Quran is here for the living souls. For the living souls before it becomes uh, for the dead people. I remember here uh, another anecdote which is a real one. We used to have our Imam in Nairobi in Kenya. He was, he was from Yemen. He was a great, good scholar, good Imam, very humble, very humble. So he said that one day some people came to me and uh, they said, you know that young man, what is his name? I just said his name was Abdullah, any name. He has died. All right then, please come and do Talteen on his grave. So what is Talteen? Talteen is Arabic word which is translated as dictation. So there is a practice which is done by some people, but this practice is not based upon Sunnah. It is based upon a very, very big hadith. Very big hadith. We said that when a person dies, all right, when he is buried, at that time, that is true, that is true that two angels would come and they ask certain questions. But Talpin means that you, as the Imam, you stand by the grave 
and then you say to the deceased person, oh, oh, my dear, my deceased person, eh? oh, my dear, when the two angels come to you, and they ask you, man rabbuka, who is your Lord, and say, Rabbi Allah, my Rabbi Allah. When they ask you, what is your deen, say, deen al Islam, my deen al Islam. When they ask you about who is Rasul, who is your Rasul, say, Muhammad al-Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa So this is called tarqeen or dictation. Dictation. So these people said to our Imam Sheikh Tali that this young man has died and so come for Tarqeen. He needs Tarqeen now. Hadith Talib said, Oh, Abdullah. I know that Abdullah. When he was alive, many times I asked him to come to the mosque. Hmm? And he did not listen to me. When he was alive, many times I asked him to read the Quran with me. He did not listen to me. Many times I said to him, don't do this, don't do that, this is wrong things. He did not listen to me. Now he is dead. Huh? Now he is dead. Do you think that he is going to listen to me? <laughs> he is not going to listen to me at all. So this is this is what we must understand, that this Qur'an is for living souls, for living souls. So you have to uh, have an attachment with this book of Allah SWT. It has guided so many Sahaba who became Muslim only because of Qur'an, because of listening to the Qur'an. Now there is uh, also another anecdote of that great sailor, an English sailor, who was a uh, he was always in the sea and he got voyages uh, from here to there, from uh, England to far east. So he always in the sea and he got hold of one copy of the Quran, translation of the copy of the Quran. So he started reading it. After reading it, he, he came to the ayah of Surah al -Nur. In that ayah, in that time, Allah SWT has given the example of a non-Muslim, a non-Muslim who doesn't believe in Allah SWT, he is living in darknesses. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجَعْلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ نُورٍ أو كظلمات في بحر يجين يعني a non-Muslim who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is living in darknesses not just simple darkness darknesses plural كظلمات and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives this example of how these darknesses are في بحر يجين in a stormy ocean there are waves above the waves, waves above the waves. And then above it, clouds, black clouds. Sulumatun Babuha Fulkabab. Darknesses above darknesses. As you know that when a person dives into the sea, then how far he can see? No. Because of that darknesses, even the sense of finding a color, it disappears. The first color to disappear is the red color. If a person is injured because of a shock, you know, for example, he would not see a red, red blood coming out. It's gone. Deeper he dives, other colors are going to diminish, disappear. Because of that darkness, because the light does not penetrate into the sea water. Let alone, there are waves above waves. Let alone, there is the black cloud above as well, there is the light. And this is why in the end Allah SWT says, light, darkness is so pitch darkness that if a person stretches out his hand, he can't see even his own hand. This is the darkness. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَدْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ نُورٍ If Allah SWT does not make the light for any person, then he got no light. 
Now this person, this English sailor, he got something else from this ayah. Totally different thing. What, what came to his mind? Oh, he said, oh, this book, which uh, the Muslims say that this is Muhammad's book. They say this is book by Muhammad sallallahu So Muhammad must be the one of the greatest sinners in the world. Because this person must have traveled a lot until he knew the ocean life, until he knew what is the darkness in the ocean life. So he must be a very great sailor. This is the idea which struck him when he read this description of the ocean life. So from there to verify this thing, he called upon one of the crews, because they were crews working from Southeast Asia, from Indonesia, from Malaysia. He called upon one of them and he asked him this question. Tell me one thing. You are Muslim? Yes, I am Muslim. So said, tell me one thing. Did Muhammad was Muhammad a great sailor? He said, oh, stop him. Oh, stop him. <laughs> he did not travel in the ocean at all. His two travelings outside Arabia were towards Sham, towards Busra, Syria, not more than that. He never went into the sea. So then how come he could describe the ocean life in such a perfect manner? With minute details. No, he must be a sailor. He <laughs> said, so no, he was not a sailor. Why? He said, because this description which is coming in the Quran, it is not described by him. It is described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the creator of the oceans. Allah who created the oceans, he, he has described this ocean life. So now this ayah led this person to think and reflect, to think and reflect until he entered into Islam. See, the ayah of Quran struck you. Many people, they, they become Muslim only after listening to our Quran. I remember that uh, young lady who became Muslim. She was in our house because an Arab young man proposed marriage to her and I'm going to wed them both. And at that time, suddenly we got many guests. A deputation uh, which was led by one of our brothers in, in Germany, also in the Muslim Germany. And he used to bring groups of uh, men and women to see around, to see the Muslim land. So he came to London as well. So that day he came and our house was full with all the guests. Because when they heard that she is going to marry, all of them they came. So this woman uh, was saying that this happened to me twice. What? And when I embraced Islam, all my family deserted me. Nobody wants to, to know about me. I was left alone. I was left alone. What to do? I took the book of Allah SWT and started reading it. And the surah which she opened to read, Abduha, Wallayli za saja, ma vaddaaka rabbuka wa ma qala. This ayah, ma vaddaaka rabbuka wa ma qala. Your Lord did not forsake you. Your Lord did not despise you. This ayah which was revealed to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was a uh, persecuted person in Makkah, all the Muslims around him, they were also persecuted. Allah SWT revealed this surah in which it is said, Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa don't worry. Allah did not forsake you. Allah did not despise you. And she said that when I read this ayah, I thought that this ayah is revealed about me. Allah is addressing me. Allah is telling me. Woman, don't worry, don't worry, Allah did not forsake you. 
So it gave her courage at that time. And she said, this is the second time when I was uh, marrying this person and uh, I thought that there is no one to take care about me. All of a sudden, so many guests came and so many people were around her. And this is how she got a lot of relief. So when you read the book of Allah SWT, you are inspired. You are inspired. Sometimes you might be in some worries. And uh, just because reading the book of Allah SWT, you will have the answer of all your worries. There was another uh, in the history of Islam. They say about a person who was a rover. A rover. He used to rob the people. And especially these uh, robbers, they, they come out at night time. Mm -hmm. So this is why Allah SWT has asked us to take refuge from the from the dangers of light as well. For daily hours. So at night time they come out. So this person, he was in Baghdad, in Iraq. And he came to, he entered one house, just for this robbery. And what happened? There is a man sitting there reading our Quran. And he was reading our Quran in a very loud voice. Alam he is reading this ayah. It's not the time pure, it's not the time right for the believer. That their hearts become fearful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. So this person, he was an Arab as well. When he heard this ayah, he said, Oh. Allah SWT is addressing me, addressing me. Alam yana lilladhina amun wa nitaqsa akulubum li zikrillah. All life I am doing this, uh, this type of nonsense, robbing the people. This ayah struck him at that time. And after listening to this ayah, he said, no more. No more. No more robbery. No more things. Tubtu ilallah. Tubtu ilallah. I repent to Allah SWT. <laughs> and he was very truthful in his repentance and he became a great saint, a great person. The people know him as Fuwayl ibn Iyal, Fuwayl ibn Iyal, a great saint in the Islamic history. So that was his past, that was his past wrong. But with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was guided to to correct himself, to correct himself and to purify himself. So, my my dear brothers, a you know, lot of things could be said in this regard uh, about this subject, but the main thing is that all of us we need purification. Wherever we are, this is our this is our destiny that we are uh, born in this century, twenty first century. This is our destiny that we ended up here in this country. Mm -hmm. But the guidance which is given by Allah SWT is good for all the times and for all the places. So the ways of purification which are given by Allah SWT and by the Prophet they were good 1400 years ago and they were good now as well. Purify yourself. Purify yourself with attending the prayers. Be near to the mosque because those people who live uh, far away from the mosque, they don't have much opportunities to come and frequently visit the mosque. So this is why I would say that in this country, it is something very good for the Muslims to be around the mosque, living around the mosque. They themselves come from the prayer, they bring their children for education as well. And 
and the thing which I have mentioned again and again, and that is the Quran itself. Quran itself. There is also, I may end up, end with the mention of a great lady. She has written about uh, Islam a lot in English. Maryam Damina, her name. Maryam Damina. So that lady is in the 60s, she became Muslim. She was an American from a Jewish uh, family. And she was fond of music. And uh, through the music, he knew about uh, the Arabic music. And she became very fond of Arabic music. She became fond of Hindu music. But when she heard the recitation of Surah Maryam from Nukulzu, she liked it a lot. But still she was searching for, for the truth. And then he said, uh, from where to find out about Islam? So she got a translation of John Sain. That is one of the oldest English translations of Allah. So she read it, but uh, she was not impressed because the language was difficult and this man himself was not sincere in translating the Quran perfectly. So she was not impressed. But she read it. Then she got hold of uh, the translation of Marmar Duke Pixar. Now Marmar Duke Pixar is an English person who translated in 30s, 1930s, of Quran as well. And his English uh, was present the English, was a good English. So when she read Pixar's translation, she said, Oh, this is the real translation. And this is how she came nearer to Islam. And uh, at the age of 1920, she was converted to Islam. So this lady was guided through Al-Qur'an itself, let alone the Arabic Qur'an, through the translation of Al-Qur'an. So in the end I will say to you, I will advise you that you read, mashallah, a lot of the Qur'an, but <coughs> the passage which we have uh, read in, in Arabic, read the translation as well. In English, in your language, in whatever language you want, to find out what Allah SWT is addressing to you, what Allah SWT wants from you. That is very, very important. So make your habit to read Al-Quran with, with translation, and inshallah, you will see a change in your life as well. And uh, with these words, we say, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّبِيُّ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ صلى الله تعالى على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه المعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We extend our gratitude to um, Sheikh Dr. Suhaib Hassan Hafizahullah for this very enlightening uh, and very informative uh, lecture on the important topic of um, spirituality in the modern world Jazakallah khairan I, I think we've learned uh, a lot and the most important thing, inshallah, we take them away and we practice and we apply them. Now, uh, if you have any question, inshallah, you uh, may raise your hands uh, to ask your question. We can take uh, maybe two or three questions related to the topic, if you don't have any. Any question, brothers? Shall we all learn it? <laughs> yeah. any, any, probably even like, uh, uh, Any fiqhi question as well, Sheikh is allowed that. <laughs> Any question related to the Islamic law? Yes, God. Alaikum salam. Is there a difference in understanding the meaning between the Arabic term Tazkiyat al nafs and the English word Sufism? Are they synonymous or is there a technical difference? And depending on who you read or what you read, the term Sufism has different connotations and meanings. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I'll just uh, repeat the question uh, for the benefit of our brothers and sisters. Uh, he asked, like, is there a difference between the Quranic term Tazkiyat al-Nafs and the word Tasawwuf or Sufism that we hear 
uh, in the tongue of many scholars and Muslims is there a difference? So that's the question. Of the world. Yes, sir. You see, the, the use of terms is very, very important. And uh, the one thing which uh, this lady, Mariam Lamina, has mentioned, that George Shale is mentioning the word God for Allah. And uh, God is, uh, is not the same as Allah SWT. Allah SWT got some meaning. And God got uh, no meaning at all. So she said that when I read the Sa'd translation, I found that everywhere where there is uh, God in George Shale, he says Allah. Hmm? So the terminology is very, very important. In the Quran itself for purification, uh, you see the two words. The, the second word is also used in Hadith as well. So the first word is Tazkiyah, Qadaflaham and Zakkah. And uh, which is declared as one of the objectives of uh, the Prophet's mission as well. Allah SWT is saying to, say, uh, to, to Sayyidina Musa A.S. إِذْهَمْ إِلَىٰ فِرَعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ تَغَى وَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَزَكَّى وَأَعْذِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَزَكَّى Go to Fir'aun, to Pharaoh, and ask him, do you want purification? So this is Tazkiyah. This is Tazkiyah. And uh, the same ayah which I have recited, Qadaf al-Aham al the word Tazkiyah is used in the Qur'an for the purification of the soul. The second word which is used is Ihsan. Ihsan. And uh, this is in the famous hadith of Ibrahim when he came to the Prophet وسلم, in the form or the shape of a human being, asked him three qu these questions. What is, Islam? what is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? What is Ihsan? So this Ihsan is also the same meaning that uh, how you make a perfect type of uh, Ibadah. So these are the terminology which is used by the Quran. So we stick to that terminology. The same way we stick to as salah for our prayer, zakah for uh, our charity, and uh, psalm for our fasting, hajj for our pilgrimage. We have to stick with these terms. So our terminology is this one. Because as long as you stick to that terminology, then you attach yourself to our Quran and to the sunnah of the Prophet when you come to any other terminology like Sufism, for example, hmm? Sufism, that that is a later technology, a later terminology, which is uh, which is not used by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, this is why uh, the word tasawuf, tasawuf, many people they wanted to find, they try to find out the root word for this tasawuf. What is tasawuf? Huh? So. The main thing is that it is a, a Greek word um, which is theosophic, theosophic, uh, theosophic, which means pertaining to God, but what is pertaining to Allah. From theosophic it becomes the So it is it is not an uh, it is not an Arabic uh, origin at all. And once you attach it to theosophic or the sawuf, then you will have uh, the whole uh, literature which is left by so many uh, great scholars who are known to be Sufis. And among them there are good things, because uh, these, um, these uh, Sufia, they were from the Muslims, so they got inspired by Quran and Sunnah as well. So we got so many good things as well. On the other hand, you will find things you can't even believe, that it, it could be Islam, no, it can't be Islam at all. So this is why I would say that let us stick to the Islamic terminology and this is the safe way for you to protect yourself and protect your being. You can read uh, the lives of those great Sufia, but pick only what is what is right, what is right. Just like uh, uh, the Bible itself. Bible. Originally it was, they were the books uh, which were revealed to the Prophet of Allah but later it, they have been interpolated, and many things have been introduced into them. Many things, many things. So, Haq was mixed up with Bati. Truth with falsehood. Lot of things. So, as in the, in the language of Tolstoy, the great uh, Russian writer, Tolstoy has said that uh, Bible 
it's just like you can say that uh, you know, if you if you find something uh, where yeah, I mean, there are so many so many things in that box but there are some pearls as well there are many stones but there are pearls as well so you are concerned with those pearls stay these pearls if you want leave the stones which you don't want in the same way we would say that even if you go to their lives take what is what is pearls in their lives what are good things in their lives yes that is going to inspire you their services for islam they want to spread the message of Islam in different parts of the world. That is a good thing which you can take from them. But anything which uh, go against the Quran and Sunnah, our criteria is follow Quran, follow Sunnah. And this is not our criteria, that is the criteria set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the criteria which is set by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Talk to Fikr and Rani, Lan tadillu ma tamasaktum bihima kitabu Allahi sunnati. I have uh, left among you two sources, Kitabullah, the book of Allah and my Sunnah, and you are not going to go astray as long as you stick to them. So that is our right. Uh, any other question? <coughs> if not, inshallah, we, as usual, we provide um, some light refreshments. So inshallah, we find some teas and some cakes available in the whole. So we can make your way in China a bit and, and enjoy the refreshments, make love for us. We also um, thank once again uh, Sheikh uh, Suhaim Hassan for being with us tonight. And inshallah, we hope he will give us more time. Uh, you know, even though it might be difficult for him, but inshallah, we'll call him every now and then to come and uh, educate us uh, in this community. Allah and thank you very much once again to you. I think we'll recite Surah Al Asr and we'll conclude by reading Al Asr in the Nisan of Al-Khusr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Asr in the Nisan of Al-Khusr 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 in the N